Well, we are back in the book of Judges. Are you guys enjoying the book of Judges? I hope so, because we have a long ways to go. <laughs> this week, we're going to be looking at Barak, and then starting next week, we're going to have a little series uh, on Gideon. We're going to slow down just a little bit. This week's going to be kind of fast. But to move on to Barak and Gideon, that means we just skipped Shamgar. And the staff gave me a hard time this, wait a minute, what happened to poor Shamgar? He killed 600 Philistines with an ox goat. I wouldn't feel too sorry for him. But we are going to skip him. The very first week of this series, I gave some background information to the book, but not a lot. And so I've decided to give a little bit as we go here. So let me just say two things. One, there is a general outline to this book. It starts with a couple of introductions, we've already navigated those, and it'll end with a couple of conclusions that'll correspond with the two introductions. And then in between, that's where we're at. We're in the cycles of the judges, chapter 3 all the way through chapter 16. Most of this series will be judge after judge after judge, and I also want to say there are two different types of judges presented in this book. There will be, some call them major judges and minor judges, um, but maybe more appropriately, ones that are cyclical or the ones that follow, the, remember those framework statements we talked about? Each one of the cyclical judges will start with the statement, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. The Lord will hand them over to oppressors. They will be oppressed for a certain number of years, and Israel will be in distress. And then the Lord will have these framework statements will come up in the cyclical judges, but they're also non-cyclical judges, very short little accounts without much detail um, of the non-cyclical judges. Okay, so Shamgar kind of just got inserted there at the end of chapter 3. Uh, Tola and Jair, the next two, will come up in chapter 10, and then the last three will appear in chapter 12. Um, all that to say that I am going um, to save Shamgar and the other non-cyclical judges uh, for a later unknown time, a time unknown to you and a time unknown to me. Um, but we'll get them in there at some point, but not today. For today... We have Barak. We have Barak's call to action. And three things here. We're going to have one reason for hesitation, two examples of readiness, and three lessons from Barak's reluctance. Well, today I'm going to do something a little different. We're just going to read right through the whole story. Can you maintain focus for five minutes of Bible reading? Five and a half minutes. Yes, I did time it. Judges chapter 4, verses 1 to 24. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Herosheth Hagoyim. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Labadoth, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah, between Ramoth and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kedesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, Go gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun? And I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon, 
with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kedesh. And Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali to Kedesh. And 10,000 men went up at his heels, and Deborah went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite had separated from the Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent as far away as the oak of Zananim, which is near Kedesh. When Sisera was told that Barak the son of Abinoam had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the men who were with him, from Herosheth Hagoyim to the river Kishon. And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him, and the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army, and the army to Herosheth Hagoyim. And all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. But Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazor and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, Stand at the opening of the tent, and if, if any man comes and asks you, Is anyone here? Say, say no. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand, and she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. And behold, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man who you are, whom you are seeking. So he went into her tent, and there lay Sisera dead with the tent peg in his temple. And on that day, God subdued Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the people of Israel. And the hand of the people of Israel pressed harder and harder against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they destroyed Jabin, the king of Canaan. Whew. Very good. Well, in chapter 4, we find what? A story of a reluctant deliverer. As it begins, we once again see the framework statements. There they are, four of them. Classic framework statements that describe people of Israel doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord and the Lord handing them over to oppressors, the people being in distress, being oppressed for a certain period of time. And then we kind of stall out on the Lord raising up a deliverer. Things get a little more muddled at that point. But eventually, there is a great victory for Israel. They rout the Canaanites with another gruesome conclusion. Did you notice that? Last week, we had a makeshift sword going into a belly. This week, we have a tent peg going into a temple. Well, the story here really is all about the reluctance of their deliverer. Okay, And to set that up, 
in the introduction here, there are a few details given of the kind of distress that Israel is going through. First of all, we're made aware of the oppressor. It's Jabin, the king of Canaan. But it's interesting, Jabin is introduced as the king, but most of the story is about who? It's Sisera. His commander, Sisera, becomes the upfront antagonist in the story. Some believe that Sisera is really the real terror here. He may, many commentators believe that he was a mercenary. He was a frightful man who had an army and was uh, paid for his uh, services, and he did oppress the people of Israel cruelly uh, for 20 years. And with this description of him, we're told of one reason that you might have guessed the Israelites would have a hesitation in confronting their oppressor, and you might actually call it 900 reasons for hesitation, right? He had 900 chariots of iron. Once again, the people of Israel are going to be terrified by chariots of iron. Remember that in week one? Description of Judah not taking all the land they were supposed to take. It was, well, well, they couldn't. It couldn't be done. They were chariots of iron. Well, what was so frightful about these chariots of iron? I'm told that these chariots uh, were not like our modern-day tanks, which, among other things, are used to break through enemy lines. Apparently, ancient chariots were ruthless killing platforms. They were, they were killing platforms um, for the efficient slaughter of escaping troops. So when troops were escaping, these chariots would be especially effective at cutting down all the, the troops as they went, especially over an open plain. So in that sense, they're really a weapon of terror. When you fight Sisera, there is no escape. There is no surrender. It's all or nothing. You know what it reminds me a little of today? The battles with ISIS. Just that feeling of it's all or nothing. If you're captured, you will be sadistically tortured and, and killed. And this idea, when, when accompanied with a strong army, just creates a, a terror, a fear. It takes away resolve, confidence, and the will to fight. Well, here we have Israel once again seeing natural obstacles as insurmountable barriers. And they might be if they weren't serving a supernatural Lord. Their supernatural God has declared victory for them and they see natural obstacles as preventing God's promises. God's promises were apparently just reassurances of the heart, but they weren't reassurances enough for the feet. Ever feel like that? Like you know God's promises. You know that they're true. You believe them, and it gives you a warm feeling inside. I trust Him. Oh, that feels so good. But when it actually requires to step out, and do something in obedience to the Lord? Well, I'm not so sure that those promises are all that helpful anymore. Well, the timidity of the Israelites will be well represented in their deliverer of God's choice. His name is Barak. And Barak will need reassurances from a woman named Deborah. Now, Barak's name means lightning. What Deborah's name means? It means honeybee. I like that. Beautiful. Barak's uh, full name in Hebrew is Barak Obeyme. That is not true. <laughs> I did look it up this week to see if maybe Barack Obama... The staff were teasing me all week. Every time we talk about it, they'd say, oh, you mean Barack? I'm like, you're going to mess that up in my head. And I go back and forth my whole sermon. Um, and his spelling, of course, is a little bit differently. It's CK at the end. 
Um, and uh, I couldn't find any evidence. I thought maybe he was named after uh, Barak by his parents. Um, but his name does mean lightning, and there's an irony to that. There's really actually a double irony to him being named lightning. First of all, there's really nothing sudden or dramatic about Barak, is there? And yet he's going to be known as lightning. I think honeybee is perfect for Deborah. Now, growing up, honeybees, any kind of bees, were bad. But then I married this wife of mine who is all about these honeybees and how important they are and kind of helped me to understand that better. She is very, Deborah is very helpful, very, very important. But in this story of Israel's reluctance to find deliverance, in the story of Bar Barak's reluctance to answer God's call, we must notice that Barak's response will be contrasted by two examples of readiness. And they are testimonies of readiness to answer God's call and to serve full of faith in whatever the Lord has called for them to do in two women. In two women in this story. And I think that's a wonderful part of this story. God uses women. Do you believe that? He uses them today, and he's always used women, but not always in the leading roles in the biblical narrative, and they are in this story. Deborah and Jael are going to be striking um, exceptions uh, to Barak's hesitancy. It's interesting here when you look at Deborah and what is said about here. Uh, some of your translations might say she's leading Israel at this time. Again, I one week try to describe why this term judge uh, is used in the text, making judgments, those who make a, a judgments. And that is, is Deborah. She's described as judging Israel at this time. Now, she's not going to be the appointed deliverer that's raised up. That's going to be Barak. But she is leading Israel, probably not as a governor when you're an oppressed people group, right? When you're oppressed, it's a little more underground than that. But she is a prophetess. She is, as a, a prophet would be, one who is a spokesperson or a mouthpiece for the Lord. So when people want to know the Lord's will or they want to settle issues, they come to Deborah. And Deborah sits under the palm of Deborah, and people come to her and receive messages from the Lord and an understanding of wisdom and what they ought to do. She, in that sense, is very much leading Israel. It's interesting. People have different ways that they view Deborah. I'm going to move quickly uh, through this for the sake of time. <clears throat> but it's interesting how people bring up Deborah at times. And I have three views here of, of the meaning of Deborah. The first one is, since Deborah was a leader, any mention of male headship in the Bible should be disregarded. It's interesting. Sometimes you can even talk about husbands in Ephesians 5 being the head of their, their household or um, the idea of, of male headship there in the household. And somewhere in that discussion, someone says, well, what about Deborah? What about a Deborah? And it kind of throws out. I don't think it necessarily throws out the idea of male headship or the idea of um, male and female roles as defined in scriptures, as countercultural as that might be. Some people say this, Deborah illustrates the biblical principle, when men don't step up, God will raise up women instead. Have you heard that? I've actually never heard that principle in Scripture, and I don't think a Deborah is an example of that. I mean, she does remind Barak of his role, she does re reassure him in his role, but she helps to make sure he fulfills his role, right? Barak does go. If the story was about God not being able to find any man to step up in this role, and so he said, because I can find no man, I will raise up a woman instead. That might make more sense here. I think Deborah, see my preference? Deborah is the capable and called ready and willing servant of Israel to the shame of God's appointed 
deliverer. She is ready to go. And so there's a contrast here, I think, between Deborah's readiness and Barak's reluctance. Look at her. She's essentially going to say, you want me to go? Well, let's go. I'm ready. Chariots of iron? I'm not worried about that. Killing machine? The Canaanites? Forget it. Sisera? Not worried about it. But she, I'll go with you. She's putting her life on the line by agreeing to go with him and to face Sisera. There's not even the slightest hesitation. You're supposed to take from that this, this incredible faith and readiness that we find in Deborah. This woman was, was ready. Well, lest we be too hard on Barak. When he is called to go, and she reminds him of that call there in verse 6. Look in verse 8. He says, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. You know what I think he's saying there? Listen, everybody knows that the Lord is with Deborah. And Barak doesn't want to go if the Lord's not going with him. Deborah will be a reassurance that the Lord is with him. It wasn't unreasonable for him to perhaps long for that kind of a reassurance, and yet it's seen as a, a weakness that he wasn't just ready. Sometimes reasonable isn't right. Look at Deborah's response. I will surely go with you. Wow, what does she say here? Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And at that point in the story, you're kind of led to think, you're not going to get the glory, Barak. I'm going to get the glory, right? The Deborah's going to get it, but by the end of the story, it is another Israelite woman, a second woman of readiness, who takes her place in Israelite lore. It is a woman named J.L. Ever met a gal named J.L.? You do see that name from time to time. Represents, she's, I know this is gruesome, but her story represents readiness to respond to what God desires. He wants the oppressor to be put away with, right? Well, when Sisera flees on foot, he takes cover in her tent. He asks for water. She gives him what? Milk and a blanket. He looks for a night's rest. She makes sure he never labors again. <laughs> JL is seen here as one who didn't ask for the moment, but she was ready to respond. She was ready. Do you think she could have known this was going to happen? Do you think she planned this? this? If I ever get my chance, I'm going to pin Cicero to the ground. I don't think so. I think it was a makeshift weapon for an unplanned situation. She was ready. The Lord was calling for the deliverance of his people. And when this woman saw Sisera come by, she said, come. And she was ready to do what she ought to do. I know this is a, a frightful account. You have to understand the context, right? She is described here as ready and faithful and capable. She will be sung about in chapter 5 for the glory of this event. Ready and faithful, and yes, capable. I'll just tell you, I have put down tent pegs into the ground many times. I've never put one through someone's head. But this was a brave and a very, um, a, a task that she was apparently capable of of handling that I don't think maybe all of us could have handled. And then in this moment, here's Barak. Isn't this quite a scene? Barak is finally ready. He's chasing after his glory. Here's his big moment. And he rushes to jail's tent, and she, she says, I will come and I will show you the man who you are seeking. You can just imagine Sisera coming to the tent 
and ready for this moment. And he bursts into the tent. What does he find out? He's already dead. He's already dead. The glory has been given to another. Here's Barak. Oh, I'll, I'll seek hard after my glory. I'm ready for my glory. But I'm a little reluctant to do hard things or to do things for God's honor. Well, Deborah and Jael here are ready. And that sure sits in contrast with Mr. Barak. And so let's take three lessons from Barak's reluctance today. Okay, three lessons from Barak's reluctance. We're called to faith, right? Well, the first lesson here is faith responds quickly to obey a clear command. Faith responds quickly to obey a clear command. I, I think when I read this, everything in uh, yellow or whatever color that is, gold, everything in there is, is in quotation marks, and I, I think that's right. I think uh, the translators are, are right there to say that th this, is, this is all that the Lord has said. Okay, she, she says, uh, well, I'm sorry, uh, from go on is, is the quote from the Lord. Look at what Deborah is saying. Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you? Here's the command. Go gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 of the people from Naphtali and from the people of Zebulun, and I will draw out Sisera. That's the Lord is going to draw out Sisera the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give, you into a, in, uh, give him into your hand. Deborah seems to be implying Barak's already been given his marching orders. He's already been told what to do. The Lord has already commanded him to go. And really, faith here would call him to just obey the command. Faith responds quickly to obey a clear command. And this is reminiscent of a lot of Old Testament saints. Never better, I think, than Abraham. Never better than Abraham. Go to a place I will, I'll show you. Okay. He leaves everything and he goes. And then later, when he has this son, it's the only part of the promise that he can actually see and feel. It's his son. He's told to sacrifice his son. What does this Abraham does? He gets up early, right? He wakes up early. I mean, he's just kind of an immediate response. Is that how you respond to God's clear commands in your life? I feel like there's a strange, bitter subculture within the Christian faith that I'm feeling now. It's a sour, sour tones of saying you're Christian, saying that Jesus is your Lord, and then not needing to obey clear commands of Scripture. Listen, we all struggle with sin. We all struggle with sin. But clear commands in Scripture should not be overtly disregarded. Well, Barak had a clear command here to respond in obedience, and he didn't do it. Number two, faith adjusts readily when presented with an unplanned path. Faith adjusts readily when presented with an unplanned path. And I'm just going to take that from Barak's response. If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. He's saying, I don't want to go. There are things that I don't want to do here. I don't want to respond to the call that's been given to me. And he's saying, I, 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 I won't go. And I think uh, this is true of many of the Old Testament saints in particular. And you can think of uh, the prophets. Think of Isaiah and Jeremiah. How, were excited, how excited were they to respond to their call and to do what they were, were told to do, to basically issue warnings and judgment? You can think of Jonah. How excited was he to respond to the call that God uh, had given? Sometimes... The Lord will throw you a curveball. 
sometimes the situation or circumstances of your life are, are not all things equal, right? Something strange appears. It's not the path you would have chosen, and yet the Lord has you on that path. And as you're on that path, you may be called to do things that you wouldn't otherwise want to do. And can't help but to think of Queen Esther. Wow, in that huge moment where she does not want to put her own life on the line and approach the king. She's confronted and told, you have to do this. I could lose my life calling the king without being requested. And she's told, perhaps you have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. Don't be afraid to look around in your life. Maybe you've been thrown a curveball. Maybe it's not the path you would have chosen. But maybe it's the path that's perfect. Maybe it's the path that God wants to use you in. Barak's on a path that he's not hasn't planned himself. Then finally, faith sees clearly when shown the master's hand. Faith sees clearly when shown the master's hand. Ding, ding, ding. Barak finally gets this one, right? This is where he finds his footing. He raises up Israel, gets to Mount Tabor. And on that mountain, when he gathers, Sisera says, you got to be kidding me. He gets the report that Israel is there. They've gathered together. Couldn't be better for Sisera. It's a time for me to flex and show my power. Listen, fellas, today's our day. Settle up. And they make their way down to the valley of Jezreel. And they cross the Kishon River, which is only a little brook at this time. And they gather together and then... Deborah says to Barak, up, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? Now, why does she say that? Why does she say that? Does not the Lord go out before you? What does she see? What can Barak see that is so clear that the Lord is with him. Well, it's very interesting if you go to chapter 5, which is the poem or the, the song of Deborah, song that Deborah and Barak sang. And in that song, it not only has the celebrations of, of this event, but it actually gives details. Very interesting, starting in verse 19 there. The kings came, they fought. They fought the kings of Canaan at Te uh, Tanakh, by the waters of Megiddo. They got no spoils of silver. From heaven the stars fought. From their courses they fought against Sisera. What do you think that means? What do you think the imagery of the stars fighting would be? Lightning. We got a weather event taking place. The torrent Kishan swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishan, march on my soul with might. Then loud beat the horse's hooves with the galloping, galloping of his steeds. As Sisera gathered down in the plain, the Jezreel Valley crosses this, this little brook, River Kishan. Just a little brook most of the year, except for flood season, and this is not rainy season. But as is described in chapter 5, a theophonic event takes place. Verses 4 and 5, it talks about the same appearance of the Lord at Mount Sinai it takes place right here. The Lord comes in a cloud and dumps rain, and it floods the valley. And with all that rain, the river Kishon becomes a mighty torrent into the area. And it sweeps up Sisera's troops. And their chariots are now worthless. And as they scramble 
to higher ground. Deborah sees this unfold. <laughs> the Lord has gone before you. Has not the Lord gone before you? Yes. And Barak, seeing the Lord's hand, goes forth and finds victory. Faith sees clearly when shown the master's hand. Do you see the master's hand in your life? Do you see what he's up to? Do you see the victories that he's already all about? He's called us to step out in faith and go where he is. Step out where he leads. God took away those 900 chariots. Follow his hand. Obey his commands. Accept that unplanned path. And you'll see his hand. And when you see it, go. And if need be, fight. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together and close the word of prayer. Lord, we realize we are on the other side of the cross. The time for fear and faithlessness is gone. Just as your disciples were radically changed with their resurrected Lord and radically changed with the coming of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we have no reason but to trust in you. Lord, help us to trust and find our confidence in you. Help us, Lord, to see what you are doing. Help us, Lord, to see the path that you have us on, even if it's not the path of our own choosing. And Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to trust you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. And all God's people said,